Welcome to all of you who have joined us in person this evening here at the Dome at AMG National Bank in Greenwood Village, Colorado, as well as our audience from all across America watching our live stream uh, on Steamboat Institute's Facebook page. Welcome. This evening's debate will also be available for viewing later on both Facebook and YouTube, and we hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to watch that and share it with others. I'm Jennifer Schubert Aiken. I am co-founder and CEO of the Steamboat Institute. While we normally host our Steamboat Institute events, particularly our debates on college campuses, we are grateful to Earl Wright and AMG National Bank for hosting us this evening in their beautiful location here in Greenwood Village, Colorado. The Steamboat Institute has been educating and inspiring people on America's founding principles since 2008. Through innovative programming and providing direct and personal access to leaders on the national and global stage, the Steamboat Institute inspires ordinary citizens like all of us to learn critical thinking skills and to use those skills to gain a better understanding of public policy, individual liberty, and the proper role of government. For the students and young professionals who are here tonight or watching our live stream, we offer scholarships to attend our annual Freedom Conference in Colorado each year. Scholarships include travel, lodging, and conference registration, plus the opportunity to meet and visit with our speakers. We have flyers here tonight, or you can visit our website, steamboatinstitute.org, to get more information. The scholarship applications will be available online beginning in April of 2021. In 2018, Steamboat Institute launched our Campus Liberty Tour debate series to restore reasoned and respectful debate and civilized discourse to college campuses across America. Civil debate, fundamental issues facing society is vital to the future of our country. Our emphasis with the Campus Liberty Tour is on respectful and reasoned debate using critical thinking skills. We teach students and all who attend how to think, not what to think. As John Stuart Mill argued, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. The Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour is made possible by the support of individual businesses and foundations who share our vision for teaching critical thinking skills and for encouraging free speech and debate on college campuses and in communities all across America. It is because of their unwavering support and vision that we're able to bring you this compelling debate this evening. Our sponsors include Judy and Robert Newman of the Newman Family Foundation here in Denver, the Anschutz Foundation, Adolph Coors Foundation, David and Nell Box of Georgetown, Texas, Gary Cooper of Cooper Steel in Nashville, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, Harris Farms in California, Paige Lee Hufty of Palm Beach, Florida, Irene Johnson here in Colorado, Mountain Valley Bank and Steamboat Springs, Tina Snyder of the Snyder Foundation in Pennsylvania, and the Woodford Foundation for Limited Government in Colorado Springs. One of the most fundamental aspects of our republic is how we decide who our president will be every four years. Since America's founding, we have chosen our president by awarding each state's electoral college votes to the candidate who earns the most popular votes in that state. The candidate who then gets at least 270 electoral college votes wins the national election for president. Tonight's debate couldn't be timelier. This coming Tuesday, November 3rd, Coloradans will vote on Proposition 113. If passed, our state will join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, a group of 14 other states that commit to allocating their state's electoral college votes to whichever presidential candidate wins the nation's popular vote. If defeated, Colorado will continue to allocate its nine electoral college votes to the candidate who wins the state's popular vote. Before I introduce our debaters and moderator, I would like to ask all of our audience members, both in person and watching online, to answer our pre-debate poll question asking whether you favor the national popular vote or the electoral college. If you are attending here in person, 
please check your email. You should have received a link to this poll, and we would like you to go ahead and answer it right now if you haven't already. If you, um, are, if you are watching online, uh, you will uh, see the link displayed to answer our pre-debate poll and to, and to submit questions during the debate. If you are here in person also for submitting questions during the debate, you will see the QR code that was placed on your seats. Please scan this code and it will allow you to submit questions during the course of the debate, which our moderator will then select to answer our debaters. At the conclusion of tonight's debate, you will have the opportunity to vote in our post-debate poll on whether your opinions have changed. For our in-person guests, please check your email uh, as there will be a link sent to you during the course of the debate where you can check this, um, you can click to, to answer this post-debate question. For our online viewers, once again, please look for the, the link online. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our debaters and moderator for this evening. Trent England is the founder and executive director of Save Our States. He has previously served as executive vice president for both the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs and the Freedom Foundation, and as a legal policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Trent was a Publius Fellow of the Claremont Institute in 2008. He is a producer of the feature length documentary, Safeguard, an Electoral College Story, the author of Why We Must Defend the Electoral College, and a contributor to the Heritage Guide to the Constitution and One Nation Under Arrest. Trent earned a JD from the George Mason University School of Law and a BA in government from Claremont McKenna College. Dr. Benjamin Waddell is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Human Services at Fort Lewis College in Durango, where he encourages his students to think critically about the most pressing issues of our time. He has lectured and written on the Electoral College and national popular vote. Dr. Waddell earned his PhD and MA from the University of New Mexico and his BA in International Relations from the University of Colorado. Our moderator for this evening is Dan Negamir, editorial page editor of the Denver Gazette. Dan has been a political blogger and opinion editor for Colorado politics, a longtime journalist and nearly 30 year veteran of the Colorado political scene. Dan has been a paper report, senior legislative staffer at the state capitol and a political consultant. Give a warm welcome to our debaters and moderator. Thank you. You know, I was going to make um, some uh, sort of broad brush remarks about the issue itself, but Jennifer did that so well. And in the interest of time, let me just do this. Show of hands, who knows what the Electoral College is? Show of hands, who's heard of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact? Is there anyone here who feels <laughs> they don't have a handle on what that's about and the, the face off between these two concepts? Good, then we'll just leave it at that and dive right into some questions. I came up with a few myself that represent things that I, as a working member of the press, have long wondered over the course of this debate. Oh, yes, thank you. And, and, and I've also been reminded to ask you to, to do the pre-debate poll, which I think is being tallied right now. Ah. Oh. You have more faith in my eyesight than I have. <laughs> okay. Should I announce that or should I, or are we going to keep that secret? We can tell them, all right. Um, well, it, it turns out that 75% of you support the European community, which doesn't exist anymore. No, wait, that's the Electoral College, the EC. And, um, 10% of you prefer a national, a national popular vote, basically a direct vote, if you will. And 15% of you prefer uh, neither. You're undecided. You're still waiting. Presumably, uh, you have to learn more before you know where you're going to stand on that or if you're going to stand on it. So, um, so uh, thanks, Jennifer. And, and as I was saying, I was, I, uh, there's a few things that stand out to me that maybe, maybe they're not even questions that occur to you, but they're things that kind of 
got to me over the course of this debate that has played out in our state, and especially since um, all of the political advertising started on Proposition 113. So let's get right to that, if I can find where I salted that away. And particularly since Proposition 113, reconsidering the compact made the Colorado ballot, our state's voters have been bombarded with competing claims as to which a national popular vote or the Electoral College gives their state more of a voice in a presidential race. And I'm talking by their state, I'm of course talking about Colorado and the other Colorados out there that sometimes are dubbed flyover country. Which is it? Let's start with Trent. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to all of you and the Steamboat Institute for, for hosting this debate. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's always interesting to talk about something that, as Jennifer said, is, is right at the core of our constitution and the idea of having a federal republic. And so the, the, the fact that we have a question about states in presidential politics should be a reminder. We're all used to it, right? We think about presidential politics in terms of states, but it should be a reminder of what the Electoral College does, right? It, it, it is a two-step democratic process that uses the states as states, keeps the power over elections in the states, and forces campaigns to build coalitions on a state-by-state -state basis. And I think it's, it's important as we think that through, when we talk about moving away from the Electoral College, we have to remember, sometimes people will say, well, what states would that benefit? Well, even that's misleading, right? Because that's, that's taking our preconceptions about the way the system works today and applying them to a system where state lines are ripped away, whether it's through the interstate compact or, or some other method to abolish the Electoral College. Uh, it, it's, it's clear that the Electoral College does benefit flyover country right? It, it benefits those states, and, and it does it in two ways, and there, there are two different lenses, and I'm sure we'll get into this a lot more, through which to look at power under the Electoral College or within the Electoral College. One is just in terms of, uh, of which states have more clout, because every state starts with at least three electors, right? So Vermont, uh, Wyoming, right? These states have three electors, and as you get bigger, as you wind up, you know, going up the, the scale to California where they have 55 electors, even though they have a lot more, right? If you, if you divide that by their population, Wyoming and Vermont have more power per vote, right? So that's one way to look at it. The, the folks who are pushing Proposition 113 actually tend to disregard that and look at it another way. And they look at it in terms of swing states, right? In terms of which states get paid attention to, that's another way to look at it. Um, and, and both of these have some truth to, to them. Um, I think that the Electoral College is clearly better for smaller states under, under either system, right? And it is because it, it forces the campaigns to not just go where the masses of voters are, right? Not just go to the big cities, to the coasts, and you know, a few other places like, like Chicago, the Chicago Metro and the Houston Metro and the Dallas Metro, we see right now, right? They are going out, they're going out into places like Nevada and places like Iowa um, and places like Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan, right? That, that benefits everybody in smaller states because it's not just the big cities on the coast that are, that are running the show in terms of presidential politics. Thank you, Trent. And let me apologize to Jennifer. She is a pro at these debates and they are, she has meticulously developed an agenda and I just, just, glossed right over a key provision of it, and my apologies. We were supposed to have opening remarks from each of us, and Trent, um, to his great credit, helped bridge that gap, fusing his opening <laughs> remarks into an answer to my question, and I didn't mean to ask that. I shouldn't have asked that question first. Let me go ahead and give Ben, our, our other participant in this debate, an opportunity to give opening remarks. Great, great synthesis there, by the way, fusing <laughs> the two. You. My apologies again for um, having uh, stumbled in the agenda. Go ahead, Ben. And then, and then you can fuse yours into an answer to my first question too. That sounds good. Okay, okay. so um, like Trent, I'm, I'm super happy to be here. I appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, despite the conditions and having to be socially distanced, you're in a pretty spectacular place to be watching a, a debate. So um, in fact, this looks better than presidential debate. Yeah, <laughs> right. So I, I have four main points I'd like to make and then I look forward to getting into the debate. The, debate. the, the first point is the Electoral College was not created to balance between rural and urban spaces or more populous or less populous spaces. So I wanna dive into a little bit of that history so that we can understand that and I'll move on to the second point. 
1787, during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, 95% of Americans lived in rural spaces, 95%. And there was not an issue of, of debate in terms of more populous or less populous states. The, in fact, the only reason that there was is because 36% of the South was enslaved or was held in bondage. Now, what that means is that the South had to come up with the three-fifths compromise in order to have equal representation within Congress. And so if it were not for the fact that slavery existed in 1787 in the United States, the Electoral College, I'm fairly confident in saying, would not exist today. The Electoral College is a vestige of slavery. Now, that's not why I recommend the NPV, but I think it's an important historic thing to keep in mind, that there are certain vestiges of our constitution, as well as our country, that are a relic of bondage which existed in 1787. It does not exist today legally, although there is slavery in the United States, unfortunately, other parts of the developed world. Um, what does exist is a historic system that was used to counter political balance between the South and the North. And so that's my first point. I think at the very least that should give us um, reason in the democratic society to consider reform. The lecture college, point two, significantly undervalues the votes of minorities. Now, in the 20th century, demographics in this country shifted drastically. People left from the rural countryside to the urban spaces, mainly on the coasts, on the west and the east. And people went to northern cities, they went to Los Angeles, they went to Philadelphia, they went all over the country. But the rate at which minorities left the rural countryside, the Midwest and the South specifically, was much higher than the rate at which white people did. Now, I know that this sounds like it, it's focusing on race, but it really has more to do with the voting tendencies of groups and where those groups are distributed currently in the United States and how that impacts politically our country due to the Electoral College. So if we look at this carefully, people left rural spaces mainly because they were looking for more, more progressive spaces. Um, minorities in particular in the rural spaces were unable to vote, take out loans, gain employment, ride public transportation, access public education, procure good health care. And in fact, people that fought for their lives in many cases were even lynched or killed. And so when we look at the history of the 6 million African-Americans left the South, they were leaving towards more progressive places on purpose. This ironically led to them finding less representation as a result of the Electoral College, because the Electoral College in progressive places gives less weight to your vote than it does in rural spaces. So um, unfortunately, I think that's something that we have to consider. Third point, the Electoral College is undemocratic. When we look at um, our nation and we look at the rate at which people are represented, it is very different from state to state. Trent started to get into this. But if we look at Wyoming, where there are three electoral college votes, there are 187,000 people for every one electoral college vote, 187,000 for every one electoral college vote. Now, if we look at Colorado, there are 5.7 million people, but 633,000 people for every one electoral college vote. If you were to move from Wyoming to Colorado, and I met a young man at the door when I, I came in and he was from Wyoming. If he were to move from Wyoming to Colorado and vote here, his vote in the outcome would lose 70.5% of its weight in the presidential election. Now, I, for one, think that should give us pause because it, it, it just simply doesn't seem democratic to me. And I believe in democracy, um, despite the fact that we're organized through a republic. Uh, the national popular vote. I support the national popular vote interstate combat because I think it restores what our founders intended, which is people to have one person, one vote, um, equal weight in their vote. The, interstate, uh, the national popular vote interstate compact, I think provides a valuable and viable solution um, to the situation. Currently there's 14 states that have signed on to this, totaling 196 electoral college votes. For it to become binding, obviously, you'd need 270 electoral college votes. So there's still more states that need to sign on. Colorado is included in that total because Colorado already passes his legislation through elected officials in the last legislative term. And now there's a referendum to, to challenge it, um, which is the democratic practice, which is, is why we're here. Um, so I would ask you to support me in supporting um, Proposition 113 in Colorado. And at the national level, I would ask you to think about supporting the MPV generally. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, uh, you know, let me morph my question really quickly here and say, which of the, each of you tell me as briefly as you can from your perspective, which, uh, under which system presidential candidates are more likely to spend time, more advertising dollars are likely to be spent in a state like Colorado? Take it away, Trent. Sure. I mean, so 
the, the question of campaign. You know, I'm talking whistle stops. I'm talking, yeah. you know, the whole thing. Just so, so, so here's here's the challenge in defining that question, right? It depends on if you look right at the end of the campaign, right? Obviously, right at the end of the campaign, it's focused on whatever states happen to be the closest, and within those states, whatever groups of people happen, the, the candidates think they can most persuade, right? right. Um, the other states get attention, but earlier in the process. I mean, Oklahoma had all the candidates come through. Um, the state of Oklahoma, but that was during the nominating process, right? And then earlier in, in, in the campaign process. So if you, if you move to a national popular vote, right, it's a totally different calculation um, that I think would start with media markets, right? Campaigns would look at media markets. They'd look at the cost per, you know, and if you've ever been involved in advertising, you sort of know how a little bit of this works, right? Your cost per impression, if you're talking about online media, um, you would look at what those costs are and make some calculations or guesses about how much it costs to move particular groups of voters. Um, and you, you'd have to go where there's scale, right? You'd have to go where the populate, where there's some population density. Um, and you would have a new, you'd have a sort of a new calculation about swing areas. But does that mean, as the opponents of the national popular vote in Colorado argue, that it, it, will, it will chase ad, ad dollars and candidate time to the coasts? Oh, I think that's, I, I think that's, that's right, right? And, and not, you know, not to the rural Oregon coast, right? But, but to the big cities. Ben, what do you think? So I was thinking about um, Trent's earlier comments and, and now I wanna think with that alongside what um, you just said. And, you know, one of the things that came to mind when you were talking earlier with your opening remarks is the majority, the vast majority of Republicans live um, in coastal cities and they live in urban spaces, right? 80% of our country lives in an urban space today. And so I, I think it's misleading to think of rural areas as the only places with conservative voices. Um, the five most popular or populous states in, in our union have 44 million people. 44% of those 44 million voted for Trump in 2016. And so you know, I, I think urban spaces have the majority of conservative voices and we need to keep that in mind um, when we think about the national popular vote, which I think would give more voice to those spaces. The other thing I, I think that is worth um, thinking about is the fact that 98% of general election campaigning has been by presidential candidates in 12 closely debated or, or contested states, right? And 80% of that money um, or that campaigning activity and NTV ad money has been spent in only seven states, right? So if we look at Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Arizona, those are the seven states that have received 80% of visits, 80% of TV ads. Right? And so there's a huge concentration right now of candidates in spaces not like Colorado. And I think one of the reasons that Coloradans are thinking about MPB as a viable option is because no presidential candidates are visiting Colorado. So you're saying the situation's already bad. People are trying to preserve the electoral college, Coloradans who would try to preserve the electoral college. And if this is a concern of theirs, are barking up the wrong tree because they already don't have people coming here. People already don't care. Is that because we're becoming ever more of a blue state, at least by the lights of recent elections? Or is that just because of where we are in terms of our size relative to the rest of the union? Yeah, no, I mean, so if you look at Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Arizona, I mean, there's Democratic and Republican states in there. The majority of those are obviously not in the West and they're, they're not rural spaces, just whether they're purple, blue, or red, right? So the majority of the country is left out under the electoral college system when it comes to general campaigning. And I think one of the benefits of a national popular vote is it would allow for candidates to need the need to speak to other states, right? I mean, you, you have this large percentage of Republicans in states that never get visits. When is the last time Republicans seriously campaigned in California? They don't need to, right? But under a national popular vote, they would campaign in California because there is a huge percentage of Republicans in California, right? It's a large population, but it's not a large population. It's like 80% of people don't vote for the Democratic Party. There's a large percentage of people that vote for the Republican Party. And I, I believe Republicans would spend more time in California if they knew that they were campaigning not to the Electoral College, but rather the popular vote. And I think, you know, the person who gives us most reason to pause when it comes to Electoral College is Donald Trump himself, who said, if it were a popular vote, I would have run a different campaign. And I think he would have, I think that's true, right? After 2016, he, those were his comments when asked about um, whether or not he would have won under a popular vote. He said, it's an electric college that decides the campaign and that's why I ran the way I ran. For a national popular vote, I would have run a different way. And I think all candidates would. 
do you want to respond to that or, or do you feel the need to? Or well, I, sure. I, mean, I, I think there's, there's no doubt, right? I mean, California wins, right? California wins under a national popular vote. That's why almost all of the money being spent on all those Prop 113 TV commercials in Colorado is coming from California. I was right? going to get to that. All That's of it. Right. Um, I mean, it, California wins, right? New York wins, New Jersey wins. Um, there's, no, there's no question who, who the big winners are under a national popular vote and that campaigns would just operate differently. And I think that's, that's the real challenge. I mean, nobody can sit here and say, this is exactly what campaigns would do under a national popular vote system because not only have we never had it, most of the major democratic countries in the world don't use a system like that. They use a system more akin to our electoral college. Let me ask a more philosophical question here. Um, there, uh, again, in my capacity in the media, I get you know, bombarded from both sides and there are inevitably um, sort of, uh, 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 I'll call them rogue groups that will say things like in the case of the Proposition 113 debate, hey, we're conservatives, but we support Proposition 113. And there is in fact a formal movement and how, how independent of the rest of the pro-113 movement it is or isn't, I, I suppose is an interesting and tactical question. But, but let's just take their face value. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of support among Colorado Republicans in my experience for this movement, but it's there. Um, and yet, well, we, most people who are engaged in this debate are, 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 I'm going to say, and please feel free to disagree with me, either of you, that, that it's seen as pretty much a party line issue if you're a Republican. And in fact, Ben was implying this by some of his earlier remarks, that if, if you're a Republican, you're gonna be on the uh, EC side. If you're a Democrat, you're gonna be on the NPV side. If you're center right, center left, that it breaks pretty much right along that center. Um, assuming I'm right, and feel free to say you disagree with me on that, let me ask you first, Ben, why is that the case? So first I wanna to respond to the funding issue. The MPV at the state level has had more donors from Colorado than any other ballot on the issue in 2019. So it's, it's, donors have come from outside, but the, the majority of donors have, there's been a lot of donors from Colorado. The number of donors, not necessarily yeah, the dollar volume. It, right, and it's important to recognize, I mean, you're from Oklahoma, right? And you're debating in Proposition 113 in Colorado, right? So I mean, there's outside influence thinking about this issue in Colorado. I think he's calling you a carpetbagger. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but um, why does it come down to, to party lines? I don't think it truly did until 2016. If we go back to 1969, the last time that it came to Senate, the possibility of getting rid of the Electoral College, 81% of Americans were in favor when surveyed of, of a national popular vote. That was in 1969 and Richard Nixon supported it, right? And so since then, there's been a shift. And I think that has more to do with the demographic shift that I've, I've talked about. There's been a shift towards urban spaces. There's been a shift towards um, blue states in terms of population. And what you get, therefore, is a concentration of progressive voices in states that don't feel as if they have a voice within presidential elections and the choosing of candidates, even within their own party, within the DNC, because the DNC has to push um, towards the swing states just as the, the Republican Party does. And so I think there's been a shift. That said, there have been moments um, where upwards of 60 percent have approved a national popular vote. That went out the window in 2016 with the polarization under the current um, under the current political environment. So you feel there's no intrinsic, no inherent philosophical distinction there. That, that... No, not by party. I do not think so. No. What do you think, Ben? Oh, I, I think there. I think there is. I mean, I think you, you start with, uh, and you know, I, I've seen this in in talking with voters um, here in Colorado and elsewhere, right? I mean, if if you're on the conservative side, you start by giving the American founders the benefit of the doubt, right? Giving the Constitution the benefit of the doubt. I mean, that's part of what it means to be a conservative is to put the burden of proof on the side that wants to change things. And in this case, change something fairly fundamental about our, our federal republic. Um, and you know, on, on the other side, there, there is a presumption, uh, right? And I, I think this is, this is what Ben started with. Uh, there's a presumption that the American founded, founding is sort of you know, inherently tainted by racism. And you know, maybe we'll get to that. You can, you can actually prove by walking through the Constitutional Convention that, that slavery played no real role in the development of the Electoral College. But, uh, but, but there's a presumption, right, that, that at least any part of the Constitution you don't like is tainted by slavery and racism, and, uh, and therefore the, the burden of proof is sort of on the Constitution and its defenders Sexism. to prove that you should keep it. So I, I do think, I, I think there is a, a divide um, there, and obviously 2016 has sort of, you know, in, in a moment just polarized this along party lines. Let me just push it a little further. Is, yeah. is, is, is some of that, a, as, far, as you see it, based on the concept of federalism itself, that, that there's a sense that, hey, we're not a direct democracy, not that necessarily an MPV would render it a direct democracy, but we're not even that much of a direct democracy that we're supposed to be this association of states 
that gives more primacy to the states. It's a 10th Amendment uh, uh, sort of tip of the hat. Um, yeah. Is that a factor? No, I, I think that's that's right. And in a both in a philosophical way, right? The Electoral College respects states as states, and people just sort of recognize that as a good thing on its own. And in a very practical way, um, which I've I found some Democrat state legislators uh, take take this position um, that the Electoral College keeps states in charge of the election. And any system, whether it's the interstate compact or abolishing the Electoral College outright that wipes away state lines from elections will require federal control of elections. You, you cannot get away from that, right? If you abolish the Electoral College, you have to have a common set of rules, a common decider. It, it's one of the fundamental flaws with the, the interstate compact and the way it's written, but it would create, a, it doesn't solve any of those problems, it just creates them. But you would, you would have to have a federal takeover of elections and, and conservatives don't want that. And, and even some liberals don't want that. If you're a founding father, or um, for, for the hipsters, uh, I guess a founding parent or guardian. Um, ben, pick one. I don't care which one. Which and tell me what that founding parent or guardian would say about this proposal now if he or she knew what we know now about America today. They, they had to, they not only came, came forth with a time machine, but got to spend a week here acclimatizing and figuring out what this country's about now. Tell us first what that, that founding that founder of this republic would say about proposing yeah. to go to a national public. So you want me to channel my 1787? Vote? Yes, and yours is as good as anyone, yeah, so go okay. ahead. Yeah, okay, okay. I'll, I'll go with founding fathers because it's what everyone recognizes, but I like this parent term. Also. And just for the sake of entertainment, you actually have to pick one. I don't care. Okay, which founding one. fathers it is. Um, no, no, you have to pick an individual. Washington, Jefferson, Mason, Madison, just name one. It doesn't oh, I have to, Okay. Well, just say he would say. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know who would say what, but this is what I think about what the founding fathers might um, say about this. I think the founding fathers thought carefully about the idea of a republic. Republica, res publica is this term that comes from Latin that means in the public, resting in the public. And so I think they're very purposeful about that. And I think that's part of the reason that at every other level in elections, we trust the public to make decisions about who is going to represent them, right? And so I think they would, first, it would give them pause to think about a situation in which the public were not in the last 20 years making the majority of the decisions in terms of who becomes president. So I think that would be a debate they would have. Um, I also think the founding fathers would recognize that they had given the power to states in the constitution to make this very decision. This is why Maine and Nebraska do it slightly differently. They do proportional or district representation. So you'll see that you know what on all the other states are blue or red on the electric college map, but then you have Maine and Nebraska, and, and they you know some one district goes this way, another goes that way, and so they divide their votes. The reason they do that is because it is in the Constitution within their state power to do so. States can enter into interstate uh, compact because of the founders, and so. The national popular vote is not going around the founders. It's not abolishing the electric college. It's not working against the founders. It's working through the logic of the founders to work into a system that allows for the majority of Americans to feel represented when they vote for presidents in elections every four years. Trent, pick a founder and what would he say? Yeah, I, I, lo I love that question because uh, you know, oftentimes I, I remind my, my conservative friends, right? If you, you brought James Madison here today and ask him, should, should we support the Electoral College or not? He would not say, well, of course you should because I created it, right? He would say what, what you said, right? Well, tell me how it worked, right? What has actually happened? I mean, this is the intellectual curiosity of a James Madison. Now, Jefferson, you know, Jefferson might just say, well, I came up with it, so it must be good. But, but Madison wouldn't. He was a humble guy. And, and, uh, and I think if, if Madison looked at it today, he would find that it works far better than he thought it would. Right? Madison is the founding father who at the Constitutional Convention stands up and says, look, we've all decided we're not going to do a parliamentary method. That was in the Virginia plan. That was the rough draft, right? Was, a, was, was having Congress choose the president. And then this is why it wasn't, that was before the three-fifth compromise, right? The, the talk of a popular vote versus a parliamentary system and then electoral college started long before there was a three-fifths compromise and all of that. So it, the idea that it was driven by the three-fifths compromise just doesn't, doesn't make sense chronologically. But, uh, but Madison says, look, we're not going to do a parliamentary system. So we've got, we're, we're talking about a popular vote, national popular vote, or something else. And he says, look, I like the idea of a national popular vote, right? It, it's simple. Um, it's democratic, right? We're using that for other kinds of elections. But he says, we can't do it. And here's why. Because we have some very big states, and we have some very small states. And he picks out two, helpfully, one in the north and one in the south, Virginia and New York, right? And he says, look, Virginia and New York 
should not have that much power, even though they have a lot of people. And so we need to work out this district method. And eventually, Madison is the guy who, on the committee of, of 11 at the end, um, you know, puts pen to paper and comes up with the Electoral College. And they thought that it would often deadlock and throw the election to the House. Uh, but the reality is the Electoral College has driven national coalition building, right? It has driven us to have two giant coalitions, which are not, you know, when George Washington warns of political parties, he is not thinking about a system with two massive national parties. He's thinking about something much more narrow and factional. In, in a way, our two-party system is sort of the, the solution to George Washington's concern about parties, right? We have these two massive national uh, political coalitions shaped by the fact that we have an electoral college that requires a majority of electoral votes to win. I think Madison would look at that system and say, wow, this, this has, has created the checks and balances we wanted and has also worked out to help to stitch the nation back together after the Civil War and create the, the incentives that, that Ben alluded to where yeah, that some, if you're a hard left Democrat, you're frustrated because they nominated Biden because they had to moderate to win swing states. Abolishing the electoral college would mean in 2024, they could nominate AOC and just try to generate as many votes from California and New York and some other big cities. That, that's the kind of radical regional polarization that a guy like Madison definitely did not want. So Madison I, would be I pleased. disagree with AOC comment, but go ahead. <laughs> Separate debate. <laughs> well, I just I think it's the type of thing that people throw out there because it's yeah. It's She's simple. in the news. She's, well, let me do this. I, I asked each of these gentlemen to come up with some questions they'd ask one another. I think I'll I'll. I'll lob one of each to one of each. And then maybe at, at the conclusion of that, we're ready to move to the next phase. Is that right, Jennifer? If it, or, or are we ready? Are we there already? Whatever. OK, great. Um, as I said, I, I asked each of them, say, if, you know, if you could ask Trent, if you could ask Ben some questions that you, you think might be you know, uh, not necessarily zingers, but that really might, might make him have to think um, and do some fancy footwork, what would they be? Uh, maybe render his argument a little more vulnerable. Let's start with a question that Trent put to Ben. Now, Trent says you know, that he's mentioned other countries. Why do you think the major democracies like India use electoral college type systems? And do their reasons apply to us here, Ben? Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think first I'd start with recognizing that India is, is probably not the best example of democracies that we want to follow. Um, I, I would say that India is moving in a good direction and they're, they're improving in terms of representation, but India still is battling with a caste system and has you know, millions of people living in poverty. I'm not, I'm not sure that that is the, the case that we want to rest our democracy on. Um, there's a very small group of countries, about 210 countries in the world, give or take civil wars, depending on the year. Um, and there's like 10 or 13 that use the electoral college system in one way or another. So we're, we're really outliers in terms of that. So I, I just don't think that um, there are other examples of large flourishing democracies that use the electoral college and, and Trent can Germany. enlighten me. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's examples of countries that use it in one way or another, but I mean, you have a prime minister. I think it's a very different system than what the United States does. I, I just do. Because parliamentary, you're saying it doesn't, it's not the same thing. But they do have yeah. a federal system. They have however many, 10, 16 states in Germany, I can't remember. And they, uh, although arguably yeah. those states have less latitude than ours do. But. Well, in, in India, I mean, India, when they declared independence, created an electoral college in 1950, modeled on ours, although much more complicated than ours. But the reasons are very, I mean, if I could sharpen my question a little bit, because I, I am curious, sure. Ben, what you would say, yeah. right? I mean, the reasons in India are very clear, right? Very diverse. And, it, and it's regional. I mean, you have, you have regional dialects, you have regional religions, mm -hmm. right? The problem when India declared independence, clearly the overarching problem was that, that there would be an, a tendency toward political entropy that could easily tear the country apart, right? And so they created an electoral college. And, and you know, other countries do it differently, right? In, in uh, Lebanon, they literally require that if you know, if a Christian holds this office, then uh, uh, if an Orthodox Christian holds this office, I think then a, then a Catholic Christian has to hold this and a Muslim has to hold that, right? Or, or maybe I've got my factionalism a little bit wrong there, but- they have like quotas. Yeah, I mean, they have, they have a quota system to deal with that. You know, Germany, because of their federal history, has that, I mean, there, there clearly is a benefit in, in fighting against regionalism through a two-step process. I'm, I mean, I'm just curious, because that's a, I mean, that to me is a clear benefit 
there, there may be countervailing benefits to doing away with it. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about that. I mean, I, I think one would have to, I mean, it's, it's such a, there's so many factions in India, but I mean, you'd have to, there are real issues between Pakistan and Bangladesh and, and a number of places that otherwise would have held part of that, of that country that don't as a result of the conflict that existed, right? So I, I wouldn't say that electoral college system necessarily has held, you know, large factions together in that region. I think there, there has been real division, there's been real war, there's been real conflict, um, and much more than what we've seen in the last 60 years. So. And maybe to your point about the, I mean, if, if one is to agree with, to embrace Ben's view of the origin of electoral colleges being significantly influenced by slavery and the need to compromise among states, maybe indeed also it is being employed in other parts of the world where these just, just literally bloody uh, standoffs and, and generations of fighting where it's like it's it's the last best hope to try and, and, and come up with a democracy. Well, it most certainly was the last best hope at the convention. It was the last thing that was done, right? I mean, it was it was in the it was, it was the final stages when everyone was tired and this is what they came up with. But, you know, Trent had said that, that it didn't have anything to do with slavery. I think it, it had everything to do with slavery, but nobody talked about slavery because slavery was simply accepted by everybody, right? I mean, it was something that was not contested and outlawed until 1860, or almost 100 years later, right? And so when things are fully accepted, when they are so homogenous within society that they are part of society, people tend not to question and write about them. Um, the Three-Fifths Compromise was simply a way of getting equal representation or somewhat equal representation for the South. And the Three-Fifths Compromise is very much part at that time of the electoral college system. You can't imagine it without it. Um, the South wouldn't have signed on. So, Well, yeah. let's go to one of your questions, mm -hmm. Trent. You said if the electoral college is so effective, why don't we use it in other elections? Oh, he didn't say it that way. Yeah, he, he no. <laughs> so so I, I do occasionally talk to people who say, wow, I wish my governor's race was operated under an electoral college system, right? Because you have states where people feel like, you know, one, one or two cities control everything and everybody else gets ignored. Uh, the, you know, the, the reality though, I think goes back to, and I, I think, you know, I think India, Germany, all the parliamentary systems really are good examples. Because I, I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard in a debate about American politics to step back from our political moment, take off our partisan hats and really think about this the right way, right? So that's why I bring in these examples of other countries. You know, the last election in Canada in 2019, um, the conservatives got the most popular votes, right? And the liberals reelected their prime minister because the conservatives tend to be bunched up in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan and the liberals are spread out and, you know, the conservatives won huge majorities where they won, uh, the liberals won less. So, I mean, it, it, it's a parliamentary system that functions exactly the same way as our electoral college. And, um, and any of these two-step systems, right, they, they provide this, uh, this sort of protection um, or incentive for the, for the political parties to moderate. So uh, that's different, right? Scale matters in that regard. Right, you have less you have less concerns about regionalism in a city election than you have in a state election, and less concerns in a state election than you have in a in a federal election. And in a in a country as big as the United States or India or Germany or Canada, right, the potential for real regionalism to develop if you have a system that allows that to flourish, right, versus a system that has these incentives against it, um, is uh, you know is a much bigger problem nationwide than it is in you know Saskatchewan or in Colorado. So the threshold for you is the state line. That's what really when you're because of the federal system. Yeah, I mean it's the state that scale that just matters, right? It, it just so the does, geographic it does size matter. of the state or the population of the state. I mean both both matter, right? Uh, both matter in in any country that has a federal system at all, right? So the the biggest example of a country with a national popular vote. Um, I think is if you leave out like Russia and Iran and uh, Mexico is is France, right? And uh, but France does not have federalism, right? France is a centralized, top-down political system, and so there, you know, even though there's some regionalism in France and there's some urban-rural divides and things like that in their politics, um, they're a smaller country population-wise and geographically, and they don't have a, the kind of federal system that we have, or Germany, or Canada, or India. Well, let's go to some of the audience questions, and 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 I say audience as people listening in, as well as people um, who are sitting here today. Uh, these have been sent to me. Presumably, more will as they come in. Um, and I'm looking at some of these, and in no particular order of significance. They're all, of course, excellent. They all come at it from different angles, philosophically. But also, I'm getting stuff in here that's some of it is more will they'll engage philosophically from whichever angle. Some are more structural. And let's do one of those first. They're, they're just like 
these are um, Quora questions. They're like, hey, how does this thing work? And so one of them says, one, one of the people there is asking, would you please explain how the Electoral College works in a sentence, and I'm gonna add this part, in two sentences or less. And, and uh, let me ask you, since I'm sure you're not gonna disagree on how it works, whether it works in the more qualitative sense is another matter. I'll just ask one of you to take it, whoever, and just explain. You're gonna have one sentence and I'll have the other? <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> no, no. Just one of you take it. Okay, so the Electoral College is a system in which you have your 538 votes. They correspond to your senators, 100 from each, uh, you have two from each state, so it adds up to 100. And then you have your 435 representatives, um, which are spread out across states, and they correspond to the population of the state. And then you have three representatives from the District of Columbia. That's your 538. That's why the website's named that, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Um, and those votes, so Colorado has nine, for example, two for the senators and, and the rest, the seven from the representatives, the congressional representatives, those nine votes go to the winner, the popular vote at the state level currently. Um, and that's true for every state except for Nebraska and Maine. That's not one sentence or two, but that's, that's the best I can do. Uh, someone here asked, what effect would national popular vote likely have on the level of polarization in this country? And this is assuming that you agree that there is a lot of polarization in this country, as a lot of people say. Um, but that itself may be a polarizing proposition. I don't know. But assuming that you feel, as is often said nowadays, gee, things are just so divisive. What effect would, and, and I'll start with you, Ben, what effect would the national popular vote have on that, if any? I think the national popular vote would allow people to feel as if they were more vested in the system. Um, I oftentimes think of a simple example when I think of uh, the degree to which this affects um, political polarization. Imagine that you were looking at a group of 50 soldiers in Iraq and they were voting in the 2020 election. And these 50 soldiers were all from different states, 50 different states represented among 50 different people in one room. Every single one of those individuals would cast the vote with a different weight, every single one, right? And so uh, interestingly enough, the soldier from Colorado would cast a vote that would be 29th in terms of its weight within the system, right? And the individual from Wyoming would be the one with the most um, binding power in that outcome, right? And so I, you know, in terms of polarization, I think what people have started to recognize across the country is that their votes do not have equal weight within the system. And much like those soldiers, whether you're a soldier, a teacher in Denver, or a professor like myself, or um, someone like a, a lawyer like Trent, um, I think what start, people are starting to recognize is that part of the political polarization is due to factions of people feeling as if their voice is not represented in politics. Now that goes beyond the electoral college. There are a lot of issues that are related to that. Um, but I think one of the reasons is the electoral college because people are recognizing, um, for example, right? There, there are now five Supreme Court justices that sit amongst nine who were nominated and put into power by presidents who were not elected by the majority of the people. The current individual who was just confirmed, um, the, the Justice Barrett was confirmed and the senators that voted for her represent 17 million less Americans than the senators that confirmed her nomination in the Senate. That's political polarization and the Electoral College contributes to it. Hey, I have a question uh, for you. Man. This mm -hmm. occurs to me as you're answering the last one and you've touched on this before. Uh, you've weighted the votes of, of, of citizens of yeah. different states. Um, perhaps this is naive, but isn't that a pretty theoretical way to look at it? Because in reality, it occurs to me, um, it's going to be, you know, the votes of some of those soldiers in your 50 soldier set are going to be crucial. And the votes of plenty of them won't matter depending upon how in play their home states are is how in play a state is a, a, a also a factor? Is it a more real world factor in, deter, in trying to distribute weight, assess the weight of a vote? Um, it, you know, arguably the weight of a soldier from Wyoming is zero because, you know, it, just the opposite, right? It's just zero. In the theoretical sense, it's very high, but in the real sense, you know, Wyoming's not in play and neither is California. Wyoming's totally in play, it's three votes. Right. And wow. and we may we may come to find Tuesday that three votes matter. But um, I, I think Wyoming's totally in play. And, you know, I, I think it, it's not theoretical. It's bound to the actual people that live in those states. Right. And so if you want to know the value of a vote, you divide the electoral college votes by the people living in that state. And you understand 
the actual weight or the value of that vote. I mean, I but is that value to the candidate? Let's say to the to the to the Democratic and Republican nominees. I mean, they're going to value the votes in the ways that 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 matter to their to the outcome on election day in terms of how many electoral votes they get. And if, and again, if you know, I mean, Joe Biden doesn't care about Wyoming. Why would he? Mm -hmm. And uh, but he would if there were national popular vote, because there are a lot of Democrats in Wyoming too. He cares about something. Yeah, and Rock Springs. So okay, Joe Biden gets Rock Springs now. <laughs> Well, I mean, just Kitty. as there are a lot of Republicans and in California, there are a lot of, I mean, one of the interesting things in national popular vote is Republicans in California would start talking to Republicans in Laramie and they would start going, hey, we should be getting together more because we want to have candidates talking to us across these different spaces. And I, I don't think that's as true. And I think that's, you know, the same argument goes for Democrats. You would start to see Democrats working across and talking across state lines in different ways. I think just how theoretical that is, though, is, is illustrated by that statement that, you know, just like there are Democrats in Wyoming, there are Republicans in California, right? I mean, in a theoretical sense, yes, but there are fewer people in Wyoming than live in a small suburb of Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I, Los Angeles County has nearly twice as many people as the entire state of Colorado, and you could throw Wyoming in there as, as pocket change, right? So, you know, we're, we're, we're back to the, the practical politics versus the theoretical, uh, and, and the reality is, you know, you could take this criticism to any election, right? I mean, obviously to the United States Senate, right, which, which, which you mentioned a, a moment ago, which, you know, most of the people pushing Proposition 113 will say, oh, we would never want to get rid of the U.S. Senate, but the reality is, the, the arguments for a national popular vote are, are more potent arguments against the United States Senate, right, than they are against the Electoral College. And, uh, it, but the same thing is true in congressional races, right? The fact that the census has been used to count uh, non-voters, right, including people who are in the United States illegally, right, for purposes of voting is a sort of modern three-fifths clause where- Can you say that again? Can you get- The fact that the census is, you know, that, that congressional districts are drawn based on not just the voting population or even the legal citizen population, But right? the, the constitution says that we should count inhabitants. Yeah, it, it, well, I well mean, fine. The, the constitution it, says we should have an electoral I mean, the college. I don't, <laughs> you don't get- so the, constitution the constitution says <laughs> that the states have the power to decide how electoral college votes are deemed. But, that that's that's but, what- I mean, My point is just that, that, you know, congressional districts have different rates of, of turnout. They have different, you know, if, if you have a congressional district that has a very high birth rate, right, then the over 18 voters have more voting power. Um, uh, because they are sort of quasi representing a younger population uh, versus a district in you know the Northeast that has a lower birth rate where more a greater percentage of the population is. I mean, my, my point is just that all of these distortions play out in any electoral system. And I think I do think it's better to look at how campaigns actually work on the ground than just sort of these abstract mathematical constructs that don't really capture politics. Well, I think what does capture politics is the fact that the majority of attention is focused on several states um, and the majority of the country is left out of elections. Well, but I mean, that, that's, if, if we want to move beyond theoretical, that is how our electoral system currently Well, works. let me use that as a point of departure for the next question. Because, awesome. Uh, and and you've kind of, you, both you gentlemen have sort of addressed this, but a lot of these questions, and again, we thank the audience for um, help fine tune and focus uh, some, of, some of the, the the concepts and the, and, the, and, the, and the facts that you guys have been imparting here. This one says, if we don't go to one person, one vote, aren't we in danger of being ruled by a minority as citizens? So they're kind of arguing as, as Ben does. Go ahead. Can I well, add to that? Yeah. Is there a breaking point as well? Is there a point at which minority rule would lead to a breaking point? So, so the, uh, um, the question, uh, about one person, one vote, right? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. The reality is, if you look at systems that have direct elections at the top, right? Now, because people, people say, oh, well, our governor's races don't work this way, but they're, they're functions of the system that we have. Uh, you are much more likely to have a presidential race where you have more candidates. And so the winner has fewer votes, right? This is, again, this is going to the practical, how politics actually work. Emmanuel Macron, won the first round of the French presidential election in uh, 2019, just actually just over a year ago, uh, with 23% of the vote, right? And now Proposition 113 doesn't even call for a runoff. So Proposition 113, right there, 23%, you win, 
right? Now, France at least has a, has a two-step election. Many of the proposals to abolish the Electoral College uh, through a constitutional amendment call for some kind of a runoff if the, if the winner gets under 40%. How, how, would, how would Proposition 113 lead to a candidate getting 22% winning? If, if you have a national popular vote, right, you, you open yourselves up much more to splinter parties, spoiler candidates, right? You would never have somebody like Bloomberg. I mean, Bloomberg had to run in the Democratic Party nominating process. He didn't have to. He didn't right? have to. That's but true. There's a major yeah, somebody who wants to run as a third the, party. The incentive, right? I mean, Donald Trump, right? The incentive was when Donald Trump looked at American politics to choose, to choose one of these big national coalitions. Mike Bloomberg looked at American politics. The incentive, and the overwhelming incentive was to choose one of these big national coalitions, right? In a national popular vote, and look, some people like this. I'm not, you know, I don't think it's a good idea, but but I recognize some people think this is a better system. It's just, you know, have have a very fractured politics. People feel very represented. The problem is the winner winds up getting 23% of the vote. And you're right? saying and, absent in a, a parliamentary system, we can't form coalitions between those between two and three winners in their respective parties. Yeah, that's I mean, in, in even parliamentary systems, right? But what you're saying to Ben's point, doesn't that presuppose that that in fact we're going to have other than a two-party system, to which by a lot of political scientists would say we're wedded as a society. And if you don't well, agree, I, they'd say just ask any third party that ever tried to get it. I think those political, I mean, I think to the extent that political scientists say that it's, it's a it's a catastrophic failure of imagination. Well, I'm just talking yeah. to about the about the scenario of 23%, you know, being the victor, yeah. being a Macron-like, but remember that that's again in a, I mean, France is a fusion of our yeah. system and a parliamentary system. But again, that's in a system that has a parliament and that has parties that 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 are out there, they're viable, yeah. so, and, they, and they make coalitions. So but, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair challenge, right? Um, I think the reality is you're, you're less likely to have functioning third parties, but you're more likely to have spoiler parties and splinter candidates, right? You're more like, so you're, you're less likely to see the develop, you just, you're not, because of the way Congress works, right? You're not going to see the development of a third party uh, that is, uh, that's a true functioning third party coalition. So, so the electoral college provides a buffer. It's an additional uh, yeah. filter to make sure that something like that doesn't well, happen. Is just, that a good or a bad thing? Well, no, I, I was just going to point out that you see in, in many democracies around the world, I mean, just look to the South, most of Latin America has functioning third parties. Um, I, I don't understand why a functioning third party couldn't emerge. And I also don't understand, I mean, Macron has to work with um, coalitions. I mean, he has built, I mean, people have to build coalitions if they're even if they're elected with 23 percent and the coalition building is part of what you argued earlier is is the beauty of american politics as you build around these coalitions within these large parties i mean it might be similar in that respect but i mean do we have to predispose the idea that our parties would necessarily disappear if the electric college disappeared i don't think they no i i'm not saying that they would disappear. Someone say they're disappearing already in colorado I, that's i mean here, here's i would just basically i guess pick up the argument of civil rights leaders in the 1970s who were, were some of the staunchest defenders of the Electoral College. And, and this was their argument, right? Vernon, Vernon Jordan, who led the Urban League, and I think he led the NAACP before that, um, made the point that the Electoral College forces the parties to take into consideration all of these little pieces of the American public because, uh, you know, at the time, right, the Democrats needed the black vote to win New York. Right and to win others, and that's still true today. Right, Georgia is in play um, because the Democrats are winning the black vote there, and you see Republicans are desperately trying to increase their percentage in the black vote. Donald Trump won Florida because he overperformed among Hispanics. Right, he overperformed in Texas among Hispanics, um, and the parties are paying attention to all these things. And you know, the, overperformed might be a misstatement because he lost sixty percent of Hispanics in both places. Well, he performed better, better than, than previous, previous Republicans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and. and I mean, he won a he won a large won share. A large right? You're talking about you know you're talking about millions of people. You mean, you mean as a Republican? Uh, yeah, as a Republican. Uh, the, I mean, I think that that argument still applies, right? The argument that these civil rights leaders made. I mean, Bernard Jordan was very when he testified before the Senate. I mean, he was very frank. He said, "Look, there there would be a real risk of having someone try to create a black political party." And pull, you know, and pull that group of people out of the Democratic Party coalition um, to try to exercise political power that way. With the Electoral College, it's clear that the power is within the coalition. Without the Electoral College, it's not so clear. And he said, "Look, that's that's not good for black voices, right? That 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 isolates that group of people." 
And you don't have to take Vernon Jordan's word for it or my word for it. The whole reason they were there in the Senate and there was this move to abolish the Electoral College, it had started back in the 1950s because Southern Democrats wanted to silence, they, they singled out the three groups they wanted to silence. They wanted to silence black voters, they wanted to silence Jewish voters, and they wanted to silence organized labor in the Democrat Party coalition. And the way to do that was to abolish the Electoral College. Well, I, th I think, you know, just real quick response, but I think we have to keep in mind that we're in 2020 and not in the 1960s or 50s. And in 2020, the vast majority of minorities that you just mentioned vote for the Democratic Party and do not feel represented within the Electoral College. And so I, th I think we live in a very different context. Do we know that latter point, though? Is there, is there polling on that? And I, I don't. I in terms know. of percentage of the minor not minorities. Not a rhetorical question. I actually don't know. Yeah, in yeah. terms of minority sentiments on, on Electoral College. Yeah, so the, I mean, it tends to be much stronger in terms of support for the national popular vote or, or simply questioning the Electoral College. But in terms of actual voting trends, um, if you look at African Americans, ranges between 88% and 96%. Oh, to for vote the Democrats, for sure. For the Democratic Party. I was wondering yeah. what the polling was on the actual yeah. of the proposition. Yeah, but group by group, I don't know. But when you look at Democrats, there's much higher support for the Electoral College. And Ben, let me ask you this one from an audience member. What who's the con and, and 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 Trent did not text this one in or have someone text awesome. This one. Sounds good. Actually, I can't. I saw him moving with his phone earlier, right? <laughs> I don't know that. Debate. What keeps the compact advocates from following the amendment procedures in Article 5? Why don't they just do it the old-fashioned way? We've done it 20, however many times. Oh my god, I can't remember how many amendments there are. How embarrassing. But anyway, they you know, do it that way. That's the way it's supposed to be done, right? Or is it? I think that the founders had a vision of a republic that evolves with the keeping of the times, right? And so I think that within the Constitution, what the MPV does is it allows four states to make decisions about how they allocate their electorals. And that's all the MPV interstate compact is, is asking to do. So, I mean, in keeping with old fashioned times, I guess you could argue that through the Constitution and through the powers that it, it vests in states, the MPV is asking everyone's agree that we should do things old fashioned. We should allow states to make decisions. But in fairness, that's a dodge. I'm just saying, you know, it's, I, I don't think the, the question is assuming that there is something untoward about, about Proposition 113 in terms mm -hmm. of its constitutionality. Rather, they're just saying, if it's the electoral college you don't like, then let's abolish it the constitutional way. Why not use the mechanism provided therein? Well, I think, you know, that comes back to the overrepresentation of rural spaces within America that we see today. It would take a supermajority in Senate in order for um, one to abolish the Electoral College. And I don't think anyone that is pushing for the MP is actually saying that we need to abolish the Electoral College, but rather update it. You know, another another thing. So, you know, I mean, true to to this individual's remark, maybe they're in favor of completely abolishing the Electoral College. It sounds as if they might be, but um, if you were to try and work that through Senate, just in 19, as in 1969, when 81% of Americans supported getting rid of it, it went past the, the uh, Judiciary Committee in Senate, 11-6 vote, I believe, and it moved to the floor and was filibustered. So Americans never got the opportunity for their representatives to actually vote on it because of the filibuster. Had they voted on it, they would have voted to get rid of it. And so, you know, I mean, that's been attempted. Um, I think a much more viable path is, is simply um, reforming the Electoral College as the Constitution allows states to do. Well, we're told the filibuster is going to go away, too. But again, that's a separate well, I mean, that was a eulogy, and I think it was an emotional moment, but yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we have. We have, um, oh, we have something else. <laughs> Somebody says they didn't answer the question about rule by minority. Anyone want to take it? Uh, I mean, I, have, I, I would love to add to that, but. Well, I, I mean, the answer is, you, you open yourself up to rule by even smaller minorities in a popular vote system. I mean, that, that's the answer. Be because as soon as you open the door to more spoiler parties and more splinter candidates, right, you're, you may not get Emmanuel Macron with 23% of the vote, right, but you could easily throw in a Bloomberg um, and not, you know, you're not, not just in a, one election like 1992 where Ross Perot does it, right, but you could have that routinely and you could also have you know, and this is uh, the, the unfortunate dark arts of politics, um, what you see in some of the states that have adopted top two primaries, where a sort of rogue group of, uh, of partisans on one side will fund, and, and I mean, this, this is happening with the Green Party candidates in some places. You have Republicans who fund Green Party uh, candidates to get on the ballot in particular swing states, right? I mean, that's not a secret, right, right, right. There are lawyers in to try to get these people on the ballot, right? Uh, you, you break down the electoral college system 
And if you're worried about minority rule, well, hold on to your hat, right? Because that's where you're gonna get real rule by smaller and probably smaller and smaller minorities over time. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I mean, I, I don't understand if minority rule is what the national popular vote would bring, why Republicans are so scared of it because it's a minority party at this point. Um, but I do, I would do wanna move to thinking about that question seriously, which is, if, if you think about this, there is a concept for this. It's called democratic strain. And at some point, if people do not feel represented enough in the government that they have elected or that in theory represents them, um, it leads to splintering and it leads to break off. It can also lead to civil war as this country can attest to. And so I think that there is a real fear that if there is a system that is continued or allowed to continue, that continually puts minorities into power that are ruling over the majority of people who have different views and ideas of what it means to pursue happiness, then I believe that you open yourself up to, to that real possibility, a splintering of a republic, um, a breakdown of a republic, um, the, the, you know, the worst possible outcome would be civil war. I don't foresee that in the near future in the United States, but I do foresee the type of political polarization that makes it very difficult for some groups in the United States to envision a common future. And I think that's a problem for any country um, including the United States. Well, let me embellish on this rec recurring question and ask this, um, or put it to you this way. Uh, reassess both of you what you just said in light of the fact that in Colorado, for example, now fully 40% of the active voting public is registered unaffiliated. Democrats are a distant number two, Republicans an even more distant number three. And by all uh, indicators, or by current indicators anyway, that distance is growing from election cycle to cycle. Um, one scenario is what you're saying, Ben. You know, you, you get this, it's, it's more that sort of um, um, uh, binary approaches. You know, there's this side and they feel underrepresented, but they're becoming the majority or they are the majority. And as you put it, their idea of pursuing happiness is different from what the minority that rules over them. Well, what about you know, let's interject this reality of this huge blob in the middle. And some of them are people who actually feel strongly about things, but don't feel like they affiliate, like they really affiliate with either party. Some of them are people, probably plenty of them, who, who aren't really that engaged with politics in the first place and don't really wish to be, but they have uh, third grade teachers and later in life spouses who harangue them about their duty to vote. And um, that's, uh, some would call that the Homer Simpson reality. Um, and that may well be a whole lot of voters. Which of these systems is more likely to engage? And I guess I have to put the onus on you because we have the current system. We have the system that yeah. Trent prefers and we have these people there. Would that, would that render more Americans politically detached, apathetic, however you want to characterize it? less? Would it address that? Would it engage them? These are people who don't seem to care a whole lot right now. Yeah. Well, engagement levels are much higher in swing states. And so if we look at swing states in this country, um, engagement is much, much higher, 10, 15, even 20% higher in some states. And so engagement is already much higher in states in which politicians actually engage with. Um, I think if we had national popular vote, you'd see politicians engaging with far more states and flyover states would actually be campaign states. And you would start to see you might see a dip in the swing states in terms of engagement, but I think overall you would see a lifting of all votes, um, which would improve engagement across the nation, including in Colorado. It would stir excitement, you're saying. Just the fact that the-, the Well, not just excitement. Candidate I think people, X is coming to town. I think people would feel as if there was something at stake for them in presidential elections. And I do not feel like that is um, necessarily the case in all, in all states currently. Let me follow up though, but do unaffiliated voters in Colorado, do so-called independents in general, really, does the average independent voter have that much of a, of a toehold on this entire debate and particularly on the structure of the electoral college, the structure that you want to go to? Yeah. Or do they even, do they even understand enough about how it works to, to know that they should feel disfranchised? Yeah, I mean, if, if people don't understand enough about the electoral college in the first place, maybe we should consider getting rid of it because you know, people should be able to understand the system that governs them. Um, it should be simple enough. But I, you know, I think, I think if we had a national popular vote, independents would be able to work closely with both parties that currently exist on, on the issues that they care about. And if those parties 
were not willing to listen because they were so distant from the electorate that they were unable to form coalitions, then yes, there would be new parties that would form. But I think that would be reinvigorating and I think it would be healthy for a democratic society that seems stagnant and polarized right now. Ooh, then I gotta ask this. Let's take Colorado again. Okay. Would we start to see um, a slowing of the growth of unaffiliated voters of, of that voting block, maybe even a turning point, which people are starting to go to both parties again um, because they would feel more engaged in the scenario that you envision? I think that's a fear that both parties um, currently feel is, is that maybe affiliates will go one side or the other. Um, I don't think we'd know. Until we By fear, you mean that they'd go to the other side? Well, I mean, I, I think the actual fear is more on the Republican side that more unaffiliated would go to the Democrats. But if we have a national popular vote? I do, yeah. Why? Because I feel as if I think the Democratic Party would move more. I, I honestly, so the way, if we look at polarization within the United States today, um, there is a larger percentage of people that, that, that at least vote and voted in last election, 3 million more than um, for the Democrats and for Republicans. And so there is a larger coalition of voters that have tended to vote for Democrats at least since 2004, right? Um, if we go back to 2004. And I believe that if we were to go to a national popular vote, the Democratic Party would do a better job of incorporating more unaffiliated voters. That, that's just my personal sense based on demographics and current affiliation of poll numbers and surveys, but I, I obviously can't predict. Trent, that. what do you think about that? Well, I, I certainly don't think we should hold the Constitution hostage to a failed educational system and say that as soon as, you know, as, as soon as people um, stop understanding how something works, we should get rid of it. Um, but uh, but I, I think something else is going on, right? I mean, it, the, the strange thing about, we're sort of taking a snapshot of where things are, and uh, we have this very polarized moment, and we have the growing, you know, I mean, it's not just in politics, right? Um, we have the phenomenon of uh, the, the growing nuns, right, in terms of religious affiliation. A lot of people have written about that, you know, and Bowling Alone um, was a popular, you know, book in the 80s, right? Um, so the, the fact that Americans are unaffiliating with institutions, I, I think if we are trying to pin that on the Electoral College, we're, you know, we're, we're almost certainly getting that wrong. Um, but I don't, I think that for, you know, if you want to sort of get, in, get crass into the, the political nuts and bolts of this, um, and I'm not saying this is why everybody supports a national popular vote, right? But just like there were Democrats in the 50s who wanted to abolish the Electoral College so that they didn't have to pay attention to blacks and Jews, right? For, for a partisan Democrat today who wants to abolish the Electoral College, I think that there is a frustration when they look at the 2016 election and they see Obama voters in the upper Midwest who switched and voted for Donald Trump, right? And you, I mean, you don't have to go very far to read an article on Slate or somewhere like that to discover how angry that makes some people on the, on the far left, right? And abolishing the Electoral College means you can write those people off, right? You don't, you don't have to, Obama doesn't, you don't need another Obama who can reach out and win over those voters, right? You can have a different kind of candidate who can draw in people from the far left um, and motivate the base. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a common sense political strategy, right? That there's, nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong about trying to win an election by motivating the base. I mean, arguably that's, that's what, uh, you know, that's what Karl Rove was. But the was base is not at. AOC, the base is not the far left, the base is a moderate Democrat. Well, but you were, I thought you were complaining about the Democrats nominating Joe Biden, right? Versus somebody like, I don't know, a Warren or a Bernie Sanders. I mean, I was thinking Mayor Pete, but anyways. Okay. <laughs> well, it depends I mean, on the state too, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. On the region. I mean, the, does, the yeah. Democratic base in Colorado is one thing. and, and in I don't think, Ohio to be fair, well. I don't think we know what candidates would look like without an electoral college because the electoral college is so predominant in the conversations of who rises to the top that we, we just don't know. Well, I think, I think what we do know is, I mean, party nominating processes are entrenched and therefore would change slowly, but they would yeah. change. I mean, they, they would change in some way. And people have pushed a national, uh, you know, for, for having national primaries, which I think would be a catastrophic mistake because I love the fact that candidates have to go and grovel in Dunkin' Donuts in New Hampshire in January. Ever since I actually went there and saw it for myself, I thought, this is genius, right? This is brilliant. If you want to change, and, and this is actually kind of a good example of, of maybe the 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 more esoteric point that we're that we're grappling with here 
if you want a really good party nominating process, you start with the smallest states and work to the biggest states. And by running it through states, you maximize, if you did it that way, right? If you think about it, you started with, the, with Wyoming and you worked your way to California, you would maximize each state's role in the process. And the parties, kind of, the parties actually kind of do this. I don't know if they understand completely why it's a good thing, right? If you just have a big national, national primary on one day, Right again, you're you're gonna you're gonna tend toward uh, benefiting the highest population areas, right? People on average are gonna have less of a voice, and uh, so people on average have more of a voice because the majority of people would actually have a voice. Well, one thing's for sure: if we had one national <laughs> primary, it would give us in the media a whole lot that's, less to do in an election true. year. And I don't know that is true. That is true. And we would we would get rid of these like blue another. state, red state images. Like I, I don't know what we'd do with our lives. Well, let me let me move on to another audience question. This one's kind of technical. Or they're, they're testing our knowledge. They're getting esoteric on us. Wouldn't proportional distribution of the electoral college votes be a better system? Is there any way to get the states to do this? It, it who, be, who wants to take that one first? I mean, I'll, I'll jump on it. Yeah. it would be better than national popular vote because if you had each state go proportional, right? No state uses proportional now. And I don't think, I don't think that any state has ever had a truly proportional model. Like it was on the ballot in Colorado back 15 or so years ago. Um, and once voters discovered it was bought and paid for by Californians, they destroyed it. Um, because if one state does it, right? This was back when Democrats thought uh, that Republicans would always win Colorado. I mean, this, this is such a funny story, right? This is, this is before 2008, after 2004, I think, or it, were, it was either in 2004 or 2006, Democrats thought, we're never going to win Colorado, but if we get them to go proportional, and we'll make this one person, one vote argument, we get them to go proportional, at least we'll win some of Colorado's electoral votes. Voters find out it's being paid for by Californians. They crush the thing. And then Obama wins California in 2008. So the ultimate example of fighting the last battle, just like I think people are focused on 2016, um, and trying to change the rules to make Hillary Clinton win in, in theory versus, versus paying attention to the future. But uh, 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 no, I. Uh, uh, well, but what would it depend on what proportional to what? I mean, you know, proportional re representation can involve uh, voting blocks in, in forms of demographics. It can be uh, representative well, if, of women, it can be representative of baby, you, versus men, uh, black versus white versus. Well, and, whatever you know, in race. And, the thing I like about proportional, though, is if you if you took the electoral college and made it proportional, you would at least keep elections contained in the states, right? You're not ripping up. Now you are creating it very much closer to a one person one vote system. Although you still have small states still have the benefit of the Senate, um, which which some people argue makes huge. the MPV unconstitutional itself, right? The equal representation in the Senate is the only thing in the Constitution that cannot be changed without. But you would still have that. Of two senators uh, per state. Yeah, under NP, but under NPV, right? You would lose the way that 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 affects the electoral. No, the two process. senators would still count the electoral college votes within that state. The state well, would just choose to allocate the electoral college votes differently. In, in, a block, in effect, know. though, that in effect that the benefit to small states would go away, right? But but uh, but if you use a proportional system, that doesn't go away, and states stay in control of elections. And I think this, you know, I mean, this sounds like kind of a wonky lawyerly point, but keeping states in control of elections means no nationwide recounts and presidents do not run presidential elections, right? I mean, anything that rips away state lines either, either forces you to federalize elections right away or creates a scenario where they will have to be federalized over time. Big conflicts. Um, let me ask you this. More than two centuries later, if indeed the, well, we know that the Electoral College was in part the result of compromise. Would you guys settle, would either of you gentlemen or both of you settle for a compromise that occurs to me now, and that's um, voting by congressional district. So the, the, the senators stay with the states and the, the main Nebraska. I'm model. making this up as I go, yeah. And of course, Nebraska does do this, and that is within the power of states, right, to, to portion them that way as Nebraska yeah. did. Does, would you find that less offensive? Would you find that more democratic? Well, I think it's getting closer to the people. I don't think it's close enough to one person, one vote, but I, th I think it's moving in the right direction. I mean, one of the things that I've, now that we're, we're wondering about scenarios, I've wondered since white 1929, why we haven't updated the house. Why not increase the number of people within Congress um, to be more in keeping with our population? I mean, we're a population that's almost double the size over 300 million people, it would seem that we need more districts. There are other parliaments and even smaller countries that are greater in number, is that right? 
I mean, New Hampshire has sure like yeah. 450 people. Oh, at the state level. No, yeah. no, 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 no yeah. countries, yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just mean, I mean, New Hampshire is an example, right? There's, For some reason, I'm thinking that, and, and please, please, please set me straight if I'm wrong about this, because I could be completely making this up and now thinking it, it's a fact, but the, the Korean parliament is like, no, nobody yeah. knows. No, we, we, agree on, know. we agree on, <laughs> on, we, we agree on this, though. How I, many I, members in the Korean parliament? I want to highlight this, though. We agree on this. I mean, this. I think this is ex okay. exactly right, right? The, the, so, so it would be less, it wouldn't be as offensive to you as going to. No, I, I mean on the point of enlarging the House of Representatives. Okay. I'll, I'll you, explain why I think a congressional like the district. Of enlarging the House I, I do. I, I think, you know, we, we have this weird idea today where, where every person we vote for is supposed to represent us. And even Supreme Court justices are supposed to represent us, right? Which is absurd, right? The president is not supposed to represent me. And the idea that, the, that any one person can represent 350 million people is not an idea for politics. It's an idea for religion, right? That is a mystical, strange idea. The president does not represent anyone. He's our hired hand to run the executive branch of government. And obviously, I want my hired hand to agree with me, right? But we have a branch of government that is supposed to represent us. Helpfully, it's called the House of Representatives. And, uh, and it should be bigger, right? It should actually represent people in a meaningful way. Today, after the 17th Amendment, we basically destroyed the role of the Senate in representing states as states. And by not enlarging the size of the House, we've destroyed the function of the House to actually be close enough to the people to provide meaningful representation. And I think this gets to a point where, where uh, I mean, we, we agree, right? You, you do have a problem in democracy where, uh, in, you know, in, in democratic systems where people don't feel represented anywhere, right? And some of that's the House. A lot of that is the administrative state that progressives have given us where doesn't matter how you you change. What a lot would be of, the divisor? How about half? Uh, I mean, would you have double? Would you have triple? What would you I have? Mean, you know, I three hundred thirty million people. If you I think use I, the formula from nineteen twenty nine <laughs> updated to the census population today, you would add about a hundred seats. I think That's I would a go lot. a little further. No, than but that. you'd have to physically remodel I'd, the building. I I well, I'd, I'd make them work from home. <laughs> I make them. I make anyway. them. Hard to get capital district. funds. I think they should stay in their districts. I think I think that members of the house should stay in. They don't they don't go into the house chamber anyway except a few times a year, right? They sit around and they, they should sit around in their districts being maximally available to their constituents. So if and you're would, in favor of moving it. the Congress closer to the people, why not the president? Because they're representatives, right? There's no, the president is not a representative office. And that's just a fundamental misunderstanding. And as I say, it's, 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 it gets into like a, a mystical kind of idea, right? That, that the, the president is, yeah, I, I just, I don't like the idea that the president is sort of our dear leader, right? I don't like it when Republican presidents talk and act that way. I don't like it when Democrat presidents talk and act that way. I don't like all the power that the executive branch has right now. I think all that's a problem. And I think a national popular vote will only make that work. But I don't, there's only one leader in the country currently talking like a dear leader and he's been empowered by the electoral college. Well, I, I think when, when Barack Obama stood in front of the Greek columns and said that the ocean would recede when he was uh, elected president, I. I think he uh, competed with anything that Donald Trump has ever said. Uh, well, we'll let you have that last For substance, if not for eloquence. Let me remind the audience, and as I have been prompted, to answer the post-debate poll, have opinions changed? Um, and then let me move these gentlemen to their closing statements. Let's see, we started with you in my un <laughs> unintentionally. All right, sounds good. Um, so I put together some, some pretty basic closing remarks. Um, just the other day, uh, we had a Supreme Court Justice, Amy Barrett, who was sworn into the Supreme Court. Um, as I mentioned, five of nine justices now have been appointed by presidents who um, have not won the popular vote. And the Republican senators who voted for her, as I pointed out, um, there was about 15 million fewer people represented by those senators than the Democratic senators who voted against her. Um, I think this simple fact, among with many of the facts that we've talked about tonight, reveals the degree to which the Electoral College has contributed to democratic strain in our country. Um, and I think it, it does not bode well for the future of our country. Democratic strain is what happens when the majority of citizens feel as if they do not have a voice or a vote within the government that represents them. And this was on display when Hillary Clinton won the election in 2016 by nearly 3 million votes but lost electoral college. It was display on display when Barrett was sworn in by the Supreme Court by a Senate that did not represent the majority of the country. And I think that nations can only endure so much democratic strain before breaking. 
having already been through a civil war once, I think this country should be very wary of democratic strain of the potential of it in the electoral college, specifically in this case, to cast um, real doubts about our stability as a union. I think one person, one vote is a way to move in the right direction. And I think the national popular vote would help us do that. It's a viable path, it's constitutional, and it would allow us to get closer to a situation in which the majority of people feel represented within government. And so if you're from Colorado, I would ask you to consider supporting Proposition 113. Um, and if you're from other parts of the country, like I said earlier, I'd ask you to at least consider the national popular vote as a viable option for not only improving representation, but very likely improving the stability of this country. Thank you. Democracy is a wonderful process, but it is not the purpose of government. The purpose of government, at least in our system, is something like justice or protecting individual rights. Every check and balance in the Constitution is a limit, either directly or indirectly, on democratic majorities. And the most anti-democratic part of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights, right? Which, which everyone right, left, and center, I think, uh, appreciates. Right? It doesn't matter how big your majority, you can't create a state church, you can't license the press, right? you can't interfere with the right to assemble, except maybe a little bit in a pandemic. But uh, right, the, the fact that we have in the Electoral College a two-step democratic process right, does not render it automatically suspicious. Right? Although we should ask why. What are the benefits of having a two-step process? Why do so many other countries do it this way? Now, of course, the Electoral College is more democratic than parliamentary system. Right? Uh, Boris Johnson is now the Prime Minister, of, uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom without them having a general election at all. Right? Our system is much more democratic than that. Uh, but why do other countries do this? Right? They do it because it provides powerful incentives to have truly national politics, right? To build nationwide coalitions and in the process to rub off some of the rough edges of our political factions. This is why after the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, civil rights leaders and organizations supported the Electoral College. It's why John F. Kennedy supported the Electoral College, right? And it's why people should support the Electoral College today because it is, it is a positive set of incentives on American politics that keep either party from trying to win simply by going to where they're most popular and running up the score, right? Um, it also keeps states in charge of elections. And Proposition 113 threatens all of these things with a mechanisms that, that, that frankly is even riskier than if you try to abolish the Electoral College through the, the uh, amendment process. Thanks. Thanks, Trent. Thank you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, You want me to announce this? Okay. So, wait, I'm not understanding something. <laughs> this is a. Okay. We do have some results from the post debate poll. 17% are now more in favor of the national popular vote. 25% are now more in favor of the electoral college and 58% had no change. And I believe we started with 75% in favor of the electoral college. And Rick, you said, so the final now is 17% are more in favor of the national popular vote. 25% more in favor of the electoral college. 58% no change. Okay. Gentlemen, great discussion. Let's have a round of applause for our debaters and moderator. Huge thanks again to Earl Wright and AMG National Bank for hosting us here at the Dome in Greenwood Village, Colorado. 
Please be sure to respond to our post-event survey, which will take you less than five minutes to complete. It's a series of just three or four questions. This debate video will be available on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Please share it with your networks. If you enjoyed this evening's debate and would like to help the Steamboat Institute in restoring civilized debate and discussion to college campuses and communities across America, you may make a 100% tax deductible contribution to Steamboat Institute. Go to steamboatinstitute.org or you can text Steamboat Freedom to 22525. Thank you again and please be sure to vote. Good evening.